welcome to ITREB USA's national webinar series, Aspires. As most registrants are aware, this series was initiated as one of the first institutional responses to support the knowledge building efforts of members of the Jamaat experiencing a countrywide lockdown. We've had several sessions since then. It aims to explore topics relating the faith and the world to the current times we find ourselves in, hoping to provide avenues for further reflection, thoughtful reflection and inspiration for the participants. Today, I am going to be your moderator. My name is Dr. Nargis Ali Virani, and I have the pleasure of hosting Professor Devin J. Stewart. For many of you who may be students of Professor Stewart in Emory, you know him well. For others, Devin Stewart earned a BA Magna Cum Laude in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University in 1984 and a PhD with distinction in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Pennsylvania in 1991. He has been teaching at the in the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Studies at Emory University in Atlanta since the fall of 1990. So that's a long career. Professor Stewart has just celebrated his 30 years in this department. He's currently chairing the department his research has focused on Shiite Islam, Islamic law, legal theory and legal education, biography and autobiography, and other topics in Arabic and Islamic studies, including popular speech genres such as blessings, curses, and jokes. On a personal note, I know that he's among a handful of you know, scholars in the field of Islamic studies, who is not only well-versed with what we would call highbrow, quote unquote, serious literatures, but also popular genres. And he's able to put them in really interesting, productive conversations with each other, which is really a rare skill and a treat indeed. I have been uh, you know, and in, in the audience and uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, Professor Stewart is the author of Islamic Legal Orthodoxy on the 12 Shiite legal system. And he has another publication called The Disagreements of the Jurists, which is a translation of the 10th century Ismaili Shiite refutation of Sunni legal hermeneutics by the chief Da'i of the Fatimid Empire, Al Qadi and Nu'man. His recent research includes a number of studies on the genres in the Quran, including oaths, omens, curses, and punishment stories. Today, we are going to hear from Professor Stewart the disproportionate, in terms of numbers, Shiites were always a minority, probably less than 20% even today, uh, in terms of the intellectual and cultural and uh, contributions to the Arabo-Islamic culture. It has been disproportionate and often as community, as a Shiite community, we ourselves know sufficiently enough about Ismaili contributions to this culture, but we thought it would be a great treat to hear from Professor Stewart about other Shiite scholars. So that is our topic today. And I will now hand it over to Professor Stewart. Welcome, Devin. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. I, I'd especially like to thank everyone who was involved in arranging this event, but especially Dr. Nargis Virani and Warda Aziz Ali Baluch. Um, this, uh, I've been involved with the Ismaili community for many years. I've been to the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London a number of times. I've worked with many, many colleagues, and I uh, would like especially to say hello to any of my former students who are out there listening. Uh, today, we are going to speak about the 10th and 11th centuries of the Common Era and some of the Shiite contributions to general Islamic culture during, during that time. So this is the title, Shiite Contributions to Islamic Culture, generally. And the place to start with this is with the Shiite political power. During the 10th and 11th centuries, Shiites came to rule most of the areas 
of the Islamic world. Not absolutely everywhere, but, but really 80 to 90% of the Islamic world were ruled, was ruled by Shiite dynasties. And of course, you know of some of them, especially the Fatimid dynasty, which ruled over Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, and the Hejaz, right? The Buyid dynasty that ruled over most of Iran and Iraq and had capitals in a number of places at Rai, at Baghdad, at Shiraz, also at Isfahan for a time. The Hamdanid dynasty that had two capitals, one in northern Syria at Aleppo and the other in northern Iraq. And this Shiite political power gave Shiites access to patronage. Right? They were encouraged to produce scholarship. They were encouraged to produce work for the public by Shiite dynasts. And this led to a flowering of Shiite scholarship. So this, this shows you where the Hamdanid dynasty was. Right? We have the Emirate of Aleppo, that's Aleppo in northern northern Syria, and then in Mosul in northern Iraq. Right? This, is, this is the Buyid dynasty covering all of you know, southern Iraq right? and most of Iran, right? except eastern Iran wasn't part of there. And then, and then of course, the Fatimids in the purple, this was at their height, they included in, they ruled over North Africa all the way over to the middle of Algeria. They controlled Sicily, all of, all of, uh, all of Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, part of Syria, the southern part of Syria, and the Hejaz, including the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. So if you add those, just those three together, that's a little, very large part of the Islamic world. There were some other Shiite dynasties, smaller ones in Southern Iraq. There was another Shiite dynasty called the Mezyadids, and there were several others. Now, part of what happened during this time was that Shiites publicly uh, taught their religion. And they produced many works that were important in on religious topics, and they defended their positions against uh, rival groups, mainly the Sunni, but also other Shiites. And so we have in in Fatimid literature, there's a very important scholar named Al Qadi ibn Arman, who came from Tunisia. He ended up going to Egypt when Egypt was conquered and he passed away in Egypt. He wrote the fundamental works in Islamic law and theology in, uh, in the Ismaili tradition, including especially Da'am al-Islam, which has been published into English, right? The book that I translated, Ikhtilaf Usul al-Madahib, which is about legal interpretation. He wrote a very large work of hadith from the Shiite point of view and we only have a small part of that. It was a very large book. He wrote a book on commentary on the Quran and many, many other works. And it was similar for the other Shiites. So for example, if you look at the 12 Shiites in Baghdad, these three scholars were their main scholars during this period. The Buyids ruled Baghdad from 945 until 1055. And during that time, these three scholars were the main, or the top 12 Shiite scholars there. And they wrote a number of works on Shiite law, theology, and hadith. They engaged in debate with Sunni scholars, etc. In Zaidi law, one important figure was this man, Al-Nataq al-Haq al-Haruni, who was from Iran and was active in Baghdad. He wrote a number of important works on Zaidi law and theology. But in addition to the theological literature, there were other aspects of uh, written culture that Shiites were involved in. And we see some that sort of straddle the, the divide between religious literature and secular literature. Probably the most famous is Nahj al which is 
the path of eloquence, a collection of orations, epistles, sayings of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is a revered book for, for Shiites, but is also valued for its, its aesthetic qualities. Right? Another example is Ibn Hani al-Andalusi was the court poet at the court of the Fatimids, and he has a number of poems praising the Imam, etc. But it also straddles the divide between secular literature and and religious literature. But what I would like to talk about today are examples that are not really in in the world of religious literature. They're in the world of general literature, but the authors happen to be Shiites. And it's very striking that there are a number of authors who wrote books that were of wide appeal then and until today, uh, who were Shiites, so that they made uh, long-lasting contributions to general Islamic culture. And many of these authors are not recognized by the general population as for being Shiites, right? They're, they're not particularly, uh, if you ask you know, many school children in the Arab world, they will know the names of these people, they know what book they wrote, but, but they won't know that they're a Shiite. And so I think if we think about, you know, how did they become famous? Why did they become famous? Why did they write the way they did? instead of writing these other types of books that were clearly Shiite in ideology and defending Shiite positions. So these are three of the very famous, well, one is a group of people and one is the other one. al Mas'udi is a famous historian. He wrote seven large books of history of different sizes. And they sort of went over the same ground, right? And were missing the biggest ones. But the one, we have two of them, and the bigger one is called the Meadows of Gold, and it's very, very famous. And Mas'udi uh, includes in it all kinds of information about ancient history, about the Persian kings, about Africa. He traveled to India, he traveled to East Africa, he was uh, very observant, and, and his wide travels gave him a lot of information to put in his book. His book is very, very well known, but again, people don't pay too much attention to the fact that he was a Shiite. There were a group of people called the Ikhwan al Safa, which means the Brethren of Purity, and they, we don't know exactly who they were. There's a lot of debate about who they were and when they were. They know that they were philosophical in their outlook because they wrote 52 epistles that are about philosophical topics and other scientific topics, things like math, right? that they put into a kind of encyclopedia of philosophy. And they have very interesting things there. They talk about the rights of animals. There's the debate between animals and people where the animals defend their rights. And, um, but again, we think that a number of this group, at least were Ismailis and this, was another important contribution. Abu Tayyib and Mutanabi, we're gonna talk about in some more detail. He is hands down the most famous Arab poet. And that means every school child in the Arab world knows this guy's name. Right? His name means the one who tried to be the prophet, right? <laughs> he apparently in his youth, he led a revolt and claimed to be a prophet himself. And so that became his poetic nickname. But I, in most Arab countries, if you ask people, you know, what was his sect, they will not know that he was a Shiite. And this is the most famous Arab poet, hands down. It's like Shakespeare in, in English, right? So this, we'll talk about something more. A few other examples are Abu Faraj al Isfahani. He's also from, died in the middle of the 10th century. He was from Iraq. He wrote some Shiite books. He wrote he has a large book called Maqatil at Talibiyin, which is about all of the revolts led by descendants of Abu Talib, right, of the, Ali's father. So all of the descendants of Ali and, and the descendants of his cousins, etc. 
and and but he also wrote a famous book called Kitab al Arani. Kitab al Arani is a kind of commentary on the hundred best songs in the history of Arabic literature up to his time. Now you say, okay, a hundred songs, cool. He it includes all kinds of information in addition to the song. So it tells, it tells you what the song is, but it tells you where, what did the original poem come from? How did, what was the story behind the original poem? And then information about the, the poet. And it has many biographies of, of poets. It has similar verses from other poems. And it ends up being extremely large, right? The, the, there are editions of this vary. The smallest one is like 17 volumes, right? The bigger one is 28 or something. It's very large book. And is, again, it's very, very famous. And your average person does not know that the author was a Shiite. Another book that is one of my favorites and it's from also from the late 10th century is called Fihrist al-Ulum, The Catalog of the Sciences by Ibn al Nadim, also from Iraq who was probably born in Mosul. And it is a catalog of human knowledge as it came into the Arabic language. So it's something like a card catalog of all of the libraries in Iraq during his time. It's a fascinating book. And again, it's very well known to anybody who studies medieval uh, Islamic writing, but most people are not very aware that Ibn al-Nadim was himself a Shiite. Among the philosophers in the Islamic world, uh, Ali ibn Miskawai was a Shiite from the same period. His famous book is Tahrib al-Akhla, which is the refinement of morals. It tells how, it gives a program for how to, how to perfect your morals. He also wrote a very famous history called Tajarib al-Umam, and he's another character that your average person has, you know, when you go through education in the Arab world, they will know this man, they will know that he wrote Tahdib al-Akhlaq, but your average person does not realize, oh, he was a, a Shiite. So these are just some of the examples of general contributions. So we'll start talking about al-Mutanabbi. This is a statue of al-Mutanabbi in Iraq, where he was from. Uh, Al-Mutanabbi was born in Kufa, right, which is Najaf now. Right? So he, again, as I said, is the, so this is a little bit about his life. He was born in 915 in Kufa in Iraq. He was a tribal Arab. He was not well off. His father was a water carrier. Right? And as a youth, he ended up leaving town and living in the, in the desert with Arab tribes. Right? And this people attribute his ability in language uh, to some extent to this experience. He ended up in Syria and he led a revolt. Uh, they think it was for a Shiite group, right? The, the, the Qarmatis who are sort of Ismailis but ha having bad relations with the Fatimids. And he was some claim their prophet, or is it claiming to be this group's prophet? We have stories about him having his own Quran, like he made he made his own version of the Quran that had 114 surahs, like the Quran does, and and then we have some quotations from that. So, but the revolt was quashed. He was captured, imprisoned, and he repented. Right? So later he was released from prison. And then his poetic career began. And he went around, uh, the, the mode of poetry in those days was that you were a good poet, you went traveling from court to court looking for patrons, and you wrote a very nice poem flattering someone, and you hoped that he would give you a lot of money. And so that's what al Mutanabi did. And he, he praised, he's most famous for praising the Hamdanid ruler, the Shiite ruler of Aleppo, Saif al Dawla. And he wrote a number of poems for him and praising him as a warrior against the Byzantines, etc. He ended up leaving, getting upset 
with Saif the Dawla and going to Egypt, where he wrote poems for the ruler at the time, Kafur. He ended up having a fight with Kafur and left, and he wrote some very nasty poems about Kafur, about how bad he was. And then later he ended up going to Adar the Dawla, the Buyid ruler in Shiraz, right? And then he came back to Baghdad and he was killed on the way back to Syria from, from Iraq. Right? The, the books have the scene where, where he's getting ambushed by someone, by a tribe whose chief he had insulted in the poem earlier. So then he, he, his death was caused by his, his poetry. And, and doubly, because the, the story goes that he was realized there was an ambush up ahead and he was, should turn and go back, right? And his servant was with him and he asked him, you know, how can you turn back when you said this? You know, and he quotes his own poetry to him about how brave and great he was. And he's like, and he told the guy, you killed me, right? And he's like, I'm, I'm going to get killed because of you. And then he, has, he forced him to go and fight. And then he, according to the story, then he was killed. So, and Mutanabi does have some Shiite poetry, right? not much, not much. So this is one of the pieces of Shiite poetry he has that is about Yom al-Ghadir, right? the, the day when the prophet you know, announced to his followers that Ali was his wasi, right? So he uses this word wasi, which you probably know means the, the one to whom testament is given, right? that the prophet gave his testament to Ali, and that was uh, appointing him. So it reads in Arabic. I, I, I didn't write it in Arabic because I assumed people would not yes. know, not many of you would know the Arabic. So I apologize if you like Arabic script better than this. But this reads, إِنِّي سَأَلْتُكَ بِالَّذِي زَانَ الْإِمَامَةَ بِالْوَصِي وَأَبَانَ فِي يَوْمِ الْغَدِيرِ لِكُلِّ جَبَّارٍ غَوِي فضل الإمام عليهم بولاية الرب العلي ألا قصدت لحاجتي وأنت عبدك يا علي. So he says, I plead to you by him who graced the imame with the wasi, meaning I plead to you by God. Right? I swear to you by God, please do this. And and God made clear on the day of Ghadir to every errant tyrant, the superiority of the imam over them, meaning over all of the tyrants, right? Through his steadfast allegiance to the Supreme Lord, won't you see to my need and help your devoted servant, O oh, Ali? So he's asking Ali to, to help him. And he says, I ask you in, in the name of God. Right? So this is one of his Shiite poems. Uh, supposedly someone came and asked him, you know, why do you not praise Ali more, right? So this is getting at, you know, how is he a famous, famous poet? He's certainly a Shiite. Why isn't he saying more about Ali like some of the other poets are doing? And he, he explains, he says, تَرَكْتُ مَدْحِي لِلْوَصِيِّ تَعَمُّدًا إِذْ كَانَ نُورًا مُسْتَطِيلًا شَامِلًا وَإِذَا اسْتَقَلَّ شَيْءُ قَامَ بِذَاتِهِ وَكَذَا ضِيَاءُ الشَّمْسِ يُذْهِبُ بَاطِلًا So he says, I left off praising the wasi on purpose since he was a complete far-reaching light. When something stands on its own, it is self-sufficient, just as the light of the sun chases away the dark. So he's saying, Ali is like the sun. I don't need to praise him you know, because when you see the sun, he's all by himself. It's very clear that he stands out above everything else. Right? So if you want to get an idea of what his style is like, he, he operates most of the time in a heroic mode, right? So he's saying, not only he's praising people, rulers who are great warriors, he's also claiming himself to be a great warrior. He's in the great warrior club and he's a great poet too and it goes together. It's something like 
the rap star mystique. You know, you have these guys, they're saying, I am fantastic at doing rap and I'm also violent and I can beat you, right? So he, he does this. There's something complicated though. He, he praises the patrons, like the kings, but he always like reserves a place for himself. He, he does, he's not putting himself down compared to them. He's not saying, I'm your lowly servant. Right? He always has a way to put him up, himself up very high. And sometimes he doesn't say it directly, but you get the feeling like he's saying, I'm actually better than you are. Right? I'm praising you, but I'm really... Then his style is very difficult to imitate. Right? One of the reasons why he's the great Arab poet is, is he has a style that they call in Arabic, Sahl al which means literally the impossible and easy, right? Meaning that it's, it's, it sounds simple, but if you try to do it, you wouldn't be able to, right? It, it's deceptively simple. So often he doesn't use, you know, pile up uh, very difficult words. In, in a lot of uh, pre-Islamic poetry, that seems to be what they're trying to do. The, their job was to put as many difficult words in as possible to show how great they were. There are many, many lines of his poetry that became proverbs immediately. You know, the, he, he, his speech was known for this. He also uses a lot of exaggeration, which you're gonna see in a second. Okay, so this is just one example about the heroic mode, right? It says, عَلَى قَدْرِ أَهْلِ الْعَزْمِ تَأْتِ الْعَزَائِمُ وَتَأْتِ عَلَى قَدْرِ الْكِرَامِ الْمَكَارِمُ وَتَعْذُمُ فِي عَيْنِ الصَّغِيرِ صِغَارُهَا وَتَصْغُرُ فِي عَيْنِ الْعَظِيمِ الْعَظَائِمُ So this means roughly, and I translated somewhat liberally, I'm trying to get it to sound okay in English, right? Resolute deeds vary with the resolve of men, and noble deeds according to their nobility. Paltry deeds appear great in the eyes of the insignificant, right? But great deeds are nothing in the eyes of the great. Right? So here he's using, you know, great and small. So he says to small people, meaning like puny little unimportant guys, right? They do something little and they think it's great, right? But if you're really a great man, you do great things and you say, that's nothing, you know, that's, I could do much more than that. All right, so he has a number of poems where he, he brags about his own poetry, right? And he's not the only one, but he, he does it a lot, right? And he says, this is this last part of this line is one of his most famous lines. Every kid in school in our, knows this, right? So he says, I'm the one whose writings the blind man has seen, right? And whose words have made the deaf man hear. The steed, the knight, and the desert all know me, as do sword and spear, paper and the pen. So what he's saying is that I am uh, the ultimate hero and poet at the same time. It sort of it goes together and, and everyone knows me because I'm so, my prowess is unbeatable. This is another one, he says, Inna hadha sha'ra fi sha'ri malik sara fa huwa shamsu wa dunya falak. Because of this poetry, among all other poetry, is king. When it goes abroad, it is the sun, and the world is its course. So he's talking about his own poetry. My poetry goes out there like the sun, you know, going through the sky. Everyone recognizes it. And this one, he, he's saying, you know, it's easy for me because I'm so fantastic. But the other guys, they have to, they have to work hard to not even come close, right? And he says, So 
Uh, says, I sleep a full night, not worrying about the rare rhymes to come, while all others stay up at night competing for them. Right? So he's saying, they have to make this huge effort to cobble together some poetry, whereas for me, it's just natural and better. This is actually my favorite poem by al Mutanabi, and I, I like it because I think it's amusing and it's a little different from the usual. He, as we said, he, he does exaggeration, but usually his exaggeration is about how, how bad I am, you know, how, what a great warrior and you should tremble in your boots, etc. So this is about love and it says, قبل الهوى أسفا يوم النوى بدني وفرق الهجر بين الجفن والوسن روح تردد في مثل خلالي إذا أطارت الريح عنه الثواء ثوبة sorry that's wrong لم يبني كفى بجسمي نحولا أنني رجل لولا مخاطبتي إياك لم ترني right so he says on the day of separation, meaning like when my loved one went away, right? Passion wore down my body from grief. So, you know, in Arabic, you know, being in love is not fun. It's not a nice experience. It's not like going to the movies with your date or whatever. It's, it's all about pain, sickness, disease, and wasting away from not eating and being, you know, loved one. And then he says, and being spurned, separated sleep from my eyelids, as if my heart were knocking around in the empty cage of my ribs. When the wind blows my cloak aside from it, it does not appear. Like you don't, you can't even see my heart. You, all you see is this like empty rib cage when my, if my, if my cloak gets blown, right? And then he says, my body is so emaciated that if I weren't speaking to you, you wouldn't be able to see me. Right? So this, like I said, that's my, that's my favorite because it's just so, so over the top. To understand these, you have to do it in cartoons, right? You have to have the cartoon version. Of <laughs> so we, we don't have very much time, um, but this, I'm going to talk to you about Ibn Nadim and his book, The Catalog, right? This is a map from the New Yorker showing the New Yorker's point of view of the world, right? And New York is huge and you see, okay, there's a Florida and there's California, right? And it's sort of a skewed view of the world. I, I wanted to say that from this book of, of Ibn Nadim, you get his view of the world, which is centered on Baghdad. Baghdad is the center of the universe, right? So this is the city of Baghdad in medieval times it started out as a round city and it grew out of that right this is in the early abbasid period and this is a city as it would have looked around the time of ibn nadim probably would have expanded somewhat more during his time this is a map of the world right and you see that uh, i wanted to say that this is a rock here the persian gulf and if you read his book, you see he talks, he, he's very interested in east, going east into the Indian Ocean. That's the Indi interesting part of the world. He doesn't say to, he says some stuff about Egypt. He says very little about the Andalus. He says almost nothing about Western Europe, right? But he talks about India and China considerably. So it's as if he's in Baghdad and he's really thinking east is where it's at. The Indian Ocean is the interesting part of the world. This is another, another map that shows that. And, and this is an oddity of the medieval map of the world. They thought that Africa, you know, when you went down to Somalia, then there's the Horn of Africa, they thought it turned the other way and went, and went east, right? So that it went all the way out to the Indian Ocean instead of turning to the left and going down the African coast. All right, this is the Dewey Decimal System, which was invented in 1876 for libraries, to make a map of human knowledge for libraries. And Ibn Nadim was doing something similar to this. He was making a map of human knowledge. 
right? Here we have philosophy, theology, sociology, right? and he had he had ten books in his in his fehrist. And starting with scripts, so that was sort of the basis of all writing. He included scripts and scriptures, so including the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, and the Quran. Then he had the next categories were sort of Arab sciences, grammar, history, poetry. Then he had the Islamic sciences, theology, and law. And then he had the foreign sciences that came into Arabic later, right? So the Greek sciences, including philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, and medicine, stories like the Thousand and One Nights, Persian literature, et cetera. Non-Abrahamic religions, so Indian religion, Chinese religion, right, and alchemy. That was his map of knowledge. This is his map of the schools of law. And what's interesting is that he has he was an Imami Shiite, so he puts the Imami Shiite school of law. He also has Kharijis, right? And he doesn't put the Shiites first, which is very interesting for a Shiite to do. This means he was kind of ecumenical. He's not just saying on an ideological basis, of course, we're first because we're right, right? He, he put it there because that was his historical assessment of where, when the Shiite, uh, law school came into being. There's a lot of foreign material in the Fihrist, which shows that he, he carefully studied how things were translated into Arabic during this period, right? Primarily from Greek, Syriac, and Sanskrit, some from Persian, right? But, but the sciences were mainly, mainly from Greek and Sanskrit. He included other religions, he, he talks about this is the religious affiliation of scientists in the Fihrist. This is a, a scholar went and calculated this, Muhammad Hanan Hassan. He has, there are a lot of Christians involved in science, Muslims, Sabians, other groups, Jews, and it shows sort of his ecumenical uh, nature. This is a list of all of the doctors from Hippocrates up to Galen. So there's a very long list that he gets from a Greek source that is one of the main, main it's the only place where we have this list. And it's uh, hundreds of names of Greek doctors. So we're, we're running out of time. Uh, the point is that Ibn Nadim was, was quite ecumenical. He was involved with people from many different communities. He was involved with Jews, Christians, he was involved with he was interested in Indian religion, Chinese religion. He talked to Ismailis. He had Ismaili friends. He talked to Kharijis. He talked to Sunnis. He knew Christians very well. It seems that the, there's a famous Christian philosopher who was also a bookseller. Ibn Nadim was a bookseller by profession. And it seems that they were good friends, right? They, they may have had their bookshops like right next to each other. And he seems to have known uh, Christians very, very well. So this is one of the interesting things about him. And, and overall, one of the interesting things about members of the Shiite community who are writing this type of scholarship is that they seem to have a more ecumenical view than we see later when Sunnis are dominating the political sphere. Right? And the, it, often when you have Sunni dynasties in charge, they police the public much more uh, severely. They try to get Shiites out of the public sphere. They try to reduce the um, variety of, of ideologies that are publicly debated in the public sphere. Whereas when you have a Shiite dynasty, generally they're coming to, to it from a position of being a minority and they're not trying to impose their views on, on the public. This allows for the freer communication. And you see that some of these scholars really embraced the ecumenical view. They're very willing to hear other people's views, to present them, and not to try to shut them up. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, there's much more we could say about Ibn Nadim, but I don't want to 
go over time. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Stewart. That was, that was wonderful. A bird's eye view of the 10th and 11th century, uh, considered generally the Shiite century because of several dynasties as we saw it. And, and really looking at some of these names, uh, what we would assume as sort of second nature to know the classics of English literature, Shakespeare uh, and others. Here we have an, uh, you know, a rundown of some of the most famous and Professor Stewart mentioned that these were famous in general Arabo-Islamic culture. And therefore for us as a Shiite community today, uh, it is important to see that that impulse of intellectual endeavor contributing to the knowledge society without necessarily creating sectarian divides. I mean, there was literature that clearly was sectarian, meaning where it came to theological understandings, where the separation in beliefs and doctrine between the Shias and Sunnis were clearly there. There was that literature, but the Shiites generally, as Professor Stewart ended you know, very aptly, that when you had these kind of Shiites writing, what you had was a general, much more ecumenical. Uh, some would say that this was because they were a minority themselves, uh, but at the same time, there was, you can see that even as minority and smaller numbers, there was a great deal of confidence in contributing to what we would call the knowledge society. So these were people that we would take, you know, big names, the astronauts of today, and they contributed to that in terms of planetary sciences. So what you have is what for us as Ismailis today with the Imam of the time, the Imam has constantly shown this universality and a continuous impulse of pluralism that has been a part of our understandings, again, as a minority within a minority, I think that it is important for us as a community to think of these names, and that's one of the reasons we thought this would be an interesting topic. And I know that Professor Stewart could go, and the next slide is so very interesting, he can go uh, you know, for a long time with that, and we could be here for, for a while, but it's really important. So you know, some questions uh, that are coming in. Uh, one of the things is, you, know, you mentioned, uh, Professor Stewart, that you know, why did the Shiite writers write in this form? Uh, was there an element of hiding? There was, of course, there is this important taqiyya, right, that often comes up among the Shiites. Were some of these people, some of the great Shiite writers, um, did they try to hide the identity or was it over time that today, as you mentioned, these are names every kid knows if they study Arabic, even in, in, in primary school and middle school, um, they may not know these are Shiites. Was that an, a conscious effort on the part of the individuals or was it something that once the Sunni dynasties take over, it's something that happens as a natural course where there are more dominant views? So uh, with regard to these people, I think it, it wasn't Taqiyya. You know, they lived at a time when Shiites were in control and so they didn't really hide their Shiism much. So okay. if, you read, if you read the Fihrist carefully, or you read uh, Al Mas'udi's history, you know he's a Shiite. If you know anything about Shiism, right? mm -hmm. uh, there are other people from later times. So, for example, the the famous theologian whose name is Shahrastani, and they think now he was probably an Ismaili, but he yeah. was really hiding it. Right? So it's not. That's not clear from just reading his books. These, these people were Shiites and, and they seem not to have been hiding it. And it was later history that made them, their Shiite nature whitewashed. You know, the sort of people, they knew their book, but their book was, became part of Sunni literature. And so the Sunnis didn't really realize, they, they didn't, it's the same with the Saif al right? The Hamdanids are in every history book everywhere in Saudi Arabia, right? And they don't realize that, oh, it's, his dynasty was in Shiite. He had so many Shiite scholars at his court, you know? And, and part of it was 
I, there is an element of self-presentation in a general way, right? Mm -hmm. it, not emphasizing the, you know, the ideological nature as much and not trying to antagonize some news, right? Mm -hmm. But, and, and it seems that a lot of these characters were doing that. They were not trying, they're not out to like win ideological debates with Sunnis and mm -hmm. proof to them, you're wrong and we're right. Mm -hmm. but, but they weren't exactly hiding. Right. Everyone knew that the Hamdanids were Shiites. It was very clear. Mm -hmm. and, but it's but now if you read a Syrian textbook, they don't tell you that they were Shiites. Right. So this I think it's it's later history. The the other the flip side of this is some of these characters were not really emphasized in the Shiite tradition because they didn't write about theology and they didn't write about the the doctrinal topics. Right. Mm -hmm. So so Ibn and Nadim was n nothing he there there's no biographies of him in the Shiite tradition and it's only in modern times when they read it and they realized oh he's a Shiite that they started paying attention to him it was not not sort of held up as a as a, this character but but again so mainly it's not Taqiyya but they did present themselves in a kind of general general way and they weren't trying to uh, emphasize their their Shiite uh, beliefs against the rest of the audience. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting that, you know, on the level of ideology, they didn't necessarily want to convince others of it, but there was a certain consciousness of contributing to furthering the knowledge of their time. I mean, Ibn Nadim is the classic right. example of that, right? You cannot have uh, you cannot have any efforts in Islamic studies without looking at this race, if one wants to know in medieval times. So that there was a clear consciousness of it. So the other question that arises is, you know, how well integrated were the Sunni society in, into the Sunni societies were the Shiites? This was clearly, on the one hand, most of the examples that you gave were from 10th, 11th century. And obviously, in that century, there was a lot more openness. Uh, you know, someone like Marshall Hodgson said it could have gone the other way, right? In terms of general history, if circumstances had worked out differently. So, for uh, later or even in that period, uh, were the Shiites uh, well integrated into society in terms of sort of uh, living together? What what were the dynamics? Were they separate? quarters, uh, you know, some things about the culture. So during this time, they, they were relatively. There, there, were, there were tensions in places, even Baghdad, which were, the Shiites were very powerful in Baghdad, right? but there were riots between the Sunni neighborhoods and the Shiite neighborhood. But later, when Sunni political power was established in throughout the Middle East, when the Fatimid dynasty fell, to, to the to the Ayyubids and then the Mamluks, right? When the Buya dynasty fell to the Seljuks, right? Then Shiites were forced into the margin, right? So uh, what what happened? Is they they weren't necessarily persecuted and rooted out and executed, right? But they were forced to take their Shiism out of the public sphere. Mm -hmm. As long as they didn't, you know, they would be safer if they just didn't do anything Shiite in public. Right? That meant doing the call to prayer in the Shiite fashion. That meant debating with Sunni scholars about sensitive topics, et cetera, et cetera. So in later times, they, they became much less uh, integrated and marginalized. And in some places, the it's clear the population dwindled. Right? So in Egypt, there were clearly Shiites in Egypt. By the end of the Fatimid period, people had converted to Shiite Islam. There were Shiites there before the Fatimids came. But when the Ayyubids came in, uh, the population started going down. People either converted to Shiism or they left. They went to Yemen, they went to Syria. In Syria, we know that certain cities like Sur and Saida were mostly Shiite when Nasser Khosrow went there to visit. 
And several centuries later, there weren't Shiites in the town. They only lived out in the mountains, right? So, mm -hmm. so there was a big, a big change over time. And it was a number of dynasties were very much ideologically opposed to Shiites, even if they weren't actively persecuting them all the time, they were pushing them out of the public, public sphere. So this time, the 10th and 11th centuries, is really a, a, a very important time for Shiites overall in history, right? mm -hmm. both for their production in the ideological fields having to do with doctrine, but also in their general uh, cultural production. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, since you are an expert in Trawashi Islam as well, there are a few questions that are really interesting. So you, you mentioned the ecumenical attitudes of putting, so for example, even if you're Shia, you put yourself after the four you know, legal Sunni schools, as we see here, uh, was there a certain ideological rivalry between the Twelvers and Ismaili scholars at this time? Uh, were they able to be equally ecumenical or there was more strife when you were in the smaller family, so to say, there is more chances so, of, uh, of fights going on and better than the other mm -hmm. kind of thing. In scholarship on theology, there's always polemical literature. And, and as you know, in Shiite history, there's a lot of struggles between uh, various claimants to the imamate, right? So they have mm -hmm. a lot of polemics having to do with issues of who is the correct imam and who should you follow because that's absolutely crucial in mm -hmm. Shiite, Shiite history. There are, there are examples of sort of more ecumenical uh, moments. So during Fatimid times, it's very clear that there were 12 or Shiites in Egypt and that they worked for the government, that they worked as judges uh, under the Ismailis, right? There was at one point of time, uh, the, there was an appointment of judges, including a 12 or Shiite judge in, in Egypt. We know of uh, some 12 or Shiites claim Al Qadi and Norman as theirs. They, they say he was a 12 or even though he's working for the Ismailis, which doesn't make any sense. He's, he's the guy who orchestrated the entire operation in the Fatima times. But but it's for a simple reason. A fairly well-known 12 or Shiite scholar named Al-Karajiki did a commentary of his two books, of uh, Da'im al-Islam and Ikhtilaf Usul al-Madahib. And because he did that commentary and it's recorded in 12 -er biographies, that's what uh -huh. they, they, that's their evidence that he was a 12 -er. But it shows you that the 12 -ers thought that his scholarship was valuable, that because they, they agree on a lot of things. You know, they, they agree that the imamate is crucial. They agree up to Jafar al-Sadiq, right? And then they agree on the hadith reports that come from Jafar al-Sadiq. They, mm -hmm. they agree on a number of things, but as, as you said, sometimes when people are closer, they fight, they fight more. So there are, there are polemical treatises back and forth between, between the different groups. One of, the, uh, one of the questions that is coming through is when you have uh, several di Shiite dynasties, as you mentioned this time, the Buyids, the Hamzanids, the, the Fatimids, how did they stake out their territories and what were the claims and counterclaims? politically and theologically to just give you know our audience a flavor of that okay so the the short answer is this that the you know the fatimids were claiming to be imams so they were they were had they said we are the imam for everyone and all other claimants are wrong and mm -hmm. so the Umayyad caliph in spain is wrong and mm -hmm. the Abbasids are also wrong. Mm -hmm. And that was a big bone of contention. So the Abbasids claimed that the genealogy of the Fatimids wasn't correct to begin with, and that they're not the legitimate caliph, and the Fatimids responded in kind, right? They said that you're a usurpers and your claim is baseless, and et cetera. So that was very clear. With the other dynasties, they weren't claiming to be the imam. So 
they think that the Buyid started out as Zaydis, but then they changed, and they changed for practical reasons. Right? Okay. And because the Zaydis, if if you are the ruler, you have to establish an imamate. When the when the Buyids conquered Baghdad, they didn't depose the Abbasid Caliph because they thought if they did, that would just create a huge backlash and get them defeated. So they kept the Abbasid Caliph and they treated him like the Queen of England. You know, they're just going to make him... Oh, worse. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so, but in order to do that, they had to become Twelvers because the Twelvers say you don't have to revolt now. You don't have to establish the political rule right now. It's not urgent. Right? You need to wait and it's okay to you know, acquiesce for the moment and keep things under that. And, and that allowed them to recognize the overlordship of the Abbasids and, mm. and not be in a, a difficult place. And the Hamdanids didn't claim to be, they didn't yeah. claim to be Imam. They, their main claim to fame was that they claimed we are the ones who are the border warriors. We're going to fight against the Byzantines, right? That's, that's how they, and they, and they got uh, they they got support from the Abbasids, even though they were Shiites. Okay, so obviously from this audience we're getting a lot more doctrinal questions. But one of the questions that's of interest is, who are the Manichaeans? The they want to know who are the Manichaeans. And if you don't mind, stop uh, just sh stop sharing your screen. They could see a larger picture of you. Okay. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Unless you have something else that you, you want to bring up on your screen. I'm not that good in technology. Okay, just stop sharing your screen at the bottom. So, there we go. There we are, okay. So, the Manichaeans are a religion that uh, came up between the time of Christ and, and Islam. So, it's a Gnostic religion that has Christian elements and other, other elements. And it was popular in the early Islamic period and died out mainly around in the Nadim's time. So he knew Manichaeans himself in Baghdad, but he said, you know, their, their religion is dwindling right now. There are not many, not many left. Very interesting tradition and complicated. But he, he's one of the main sources for this. He's also a, one of the main sources for the religion of what they call Sabaeans, who are there, they worship, you know, star gods in the city of Haran in Syria. So they have a bunch of very specific rituals and um, he describes them in some, some detail. So here is a question. I don't know where you want to take that with, but was there any effect of doctrinal rivalry among the Muslims on their scientific theological progress as a whole? Did doctrine come in? I don't know how, but I'm basically framing it the way it's coming, where was, would, first of all, in scientific technological progress, would doctrine have played a part? And if that did, would there be some disagreements, if not necessarily rivalry, right? So there, there were disagreements about the place of philosophy. You know, the, the, the mm -hmm. pro, there, were, there were people who were in the philosophical tradition, and there were theologians who were sort of half in the theolo philosophical tradition, mm -hmm. and then there were traditionalists who were very much against the philosophical tradition, and they didn't want to hear about any Greeks proving anything, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the philosophers the, in the Arab world, there were, there were may, very many, they were pro-Greek. Like Aristotle was the first teacher. They called him al-Muallim al awwal because he, he really taught the beginnings of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the philosophical tradition, they believed in the power of the mind, and they thought that rational inquiry can solve all problems. Right? That that's what you need to rely on. And, and then the 
of the theologians, there was a group called the Mu'tazila who also they didn't take exactly the same view as the philosophers, but they were close. They they favored a rational approach. Right? So mm -hmm. they thought that your your mind can determine whether something is good or bad. And and the traditionalists said, no, you you can't. You know nothing, right? You, God has to tell you whether something is good or bad. Then you know whether it's good or bad. And before that, your mind is you're just guessing. It, it has no no real value up against revelation. And things have to come from revelation for you to get it. it. It might work in math. Like math, it's okay. You can do rational approach and that, that works. But in deciding what the religion is, anything that has to do with religion, uh, you can't use your reason because your reason won't get you the answer. Yeah, so, so that debate on this issue. That was a major, major debate, and you have many different positions. And so Ibn Rushd wrote a book about this. He wanted to show that that the revelation and reason are actually compatible. They will come up with the same answer. Whereas his opponents were saying, no, you you have to follow the text in order to know what what God's will is and your reason is insufficient. So I don't know if you are, um, you are that familiar, but with your encyclopedic knowledge, let's see. How established was the observance of Muharram among the Fatimids and general Shias? How, does, how did it contribute to solidifying Shiite identity? How was it viewed by other Sunnis? Do the poets generally allude to the practice of mourning and the event of Karbala? Any of the Shiite poets or that you've looked at or writers, do they allude to the Muharram practice or as an important identity marker? They think, they think that it, it, this before the Fatimids and the Buyids, we don't really know. We don't really know. I suspect that there was a celebration of Muharram before that time, but but all of the history books say it started when the Fatimids came to Egypt, right? And mm -hmm. when the Buyids came to Baghdad. Then mm -hmm. it became a public event, right? Both the Ashura and Eid al Ghadir, right? That mm -hmm. both of those became the two big Shiite holidays and they were they're celebrated in public. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was definitely, yes, it was all over the place during this time, and it was became a bone of contention. They, they started having riots and problems on those days because of the thing, especially in Baghdad. You had the, the Hanbali neighborhoods where the Sunni troublemakers, you know, and, the, and then you have the Shiites were doing their celebration, and then if they got too close together, someone would start, you know, insulting somebody and then it was all over and they we know what they say in baghdad that they said the shiites would put up plaques to sort of annoy the shiites the, the sunnis and they would mm -hmm. say muhammad wa ali khair al basha he says muhammad and ali are the best of mankind right so mm -hmm. okay. he says Woman ankara faqad kafar and so whoever denies it is an unbeliever <laughs> is a kafir right which means like it's like it's a way to start a fight, right? But they would put up these plaques in the Shiite neighborhoods. Right? So, so yes, and and it comes into poetry during this time. So, a Sharif al Rabi, a Sharif al Murtada, they both have in their poetry. And the the question for me is before that time. Mm -hmm. I, I assume it didn't come from nowhere. They didn't just invent it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and during this time, the the Sunnis in Baghdad actually made counter holidays for the okay. so they they did a week after Yom al Ghadir they did a holiday for Abu Bakr that they called Yom al Ghar right the day of the cave cave supposedly was in the cave going from when they went from Mecca they escaped from Mecca to go to Medina they hid in the cave so they called that day Yom al Ghar and then they would do a procession right? and like and it was. They did it on purpose one week after the Shiite holiday. And there was another one, but I forget what the other one was. But that, that, that shows you the rival, there was an intense rivalry, even though 
Even though Shiites were in a pretty good position, it was a very intense rivalry between Shiites and Sunnis in Baghdad, in the Buyid capital. They even had like sports rivalries, right? There were Shiite okay. gangs and Sunni gangs, right? And we know there were two postal runners, they had a postal service and mm -hmm. there were runners. The way they did the post would they have guys running and they would, they would run like 30 miles to deliver the post to the next guy. And there were two who were famous for being very fast. One was Shiite and one was Sunni. And they would have, you know, their fans would come out to watch them run. Right? <laughs> the, Shiite, the Shiite postal runner and the Sunni postal runner. But it was that, it was that famous that it gets into the chronicles. That, were... that is so interesting. The, the situation in Baghdad reminds me of my own upbringing in the neighborhood of Bombay, where to this day, the Shiites would put up, particularly around Ashura and Muharram, all kinds of signs and everybody would be scared that there would be some kind of scuttle at the, uh, at the least and, and major you know, encounters between the Shiites and the Sunnis to this day in the neighborhood in, in Bombay where I grew up, there was a 12 a Shiite mosque. And of course for the Ismailis, because they have a living Imam, Muharram as a, uh, as a, you know, as a commemoration in terms of mourning is not something that the Ismailis have you know, done because it makes no sense to them, they have a living imam. So they will commemorate it and respect it, but the 12 Shiites would be very upset that the Ismailis being Shiites are not observing the way they would want to. So there would be that sort of scuffle going on between that annoyance right. and with the Sunnis as well. So that's, and, and the sports team remind me of all kinds of today, high, die hard fans running for each other, right? So. Right. Right. So we know from the chronicles in, in Egypt that, that Shiites would go around on Ashura, you know, like a mob. And if anyone was like going about their normal business, they would stop them. Okay. So, you know, tell them they have to close their shop. They can't, you know, sell stuff. They would just close everything down. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is some request on certain books to recommend on the Shiite century or on medieval Muslim thought. Uh, so perhaps you can share a couple that you think that may be okay a, for regular readers, not necessarily right. you know, our students. Right. So what's a good book? There is there's a book about Baghdad, uh, I think it's by Hugh Kennedy. It's called When Baghdad Ruled the World. That's a readable, that's a readable book, book about sort of the history of Baghdad and what it meant. The Fiharist is interesting. Uh, it might not be the easiest thing to start reading. Yeah. Uh, then what's another one? There's a book called The Renaissance of Islam that's about this period. Mm -hmm. it's an old book, but you can get it on Amazon for not very expensive. And it's by Adam Metz. It was translated into English a long time ago. Mm -hmm. It's kind of old, but it's very good. Mm -hmm. And there's another one called, uh, what is it called? It's called something like Islamic Humanism. It's like humanism. Joel, Joel Kramer's two volume. Exactly. I think you're thinking of that, yeah. Joel Kramer. So to the participants, uh, we can have Dr. Sturt uh, suggest some things. I can add to it and uh, you can, uh, the administrators can also send you an email with additional resources if you're interested in following. And I'm very heartened to see that some of you are going to take that up because that was one of the objectives of, of the seminar here uh, that we try and get ourselves interested in different aspects and just these sort of stories about these kind of rivalries. This is what Devin is famous for. He remembers these and then, you know, brings them alive in, in classrooms. So I'm very glad that we were able to, there was another question and I don't know what light you want to throw on it. It's to do with the role of the intellect in Shia Islam taught by Imam Ali. You mentioned the Nahj al-Balagha. So right. some of the, our participants here are familiar with that work and some of them may have even memorized and imbibed that. So this question about the intellect, role of intellect in Shiism and how does it manifest uh, in Shi lived experience? 
if you can comment a bit on it, you have, have you lived in Iran? Um, oh, no, I haven't lived. Never lived in Iran, okay. I, I guess I would say this, uh, already in, in the Quran itself, you see that the, the Quran has a discourse of signs. Mm -hmm. And it says there are certain signs in the world that you need to pay attention to because they tell you something. And the idea is that they don't just tell you to you because they're talking to you, it's spelled out. It's like you have to observe them and then you have to interpret them. Right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it's emphasized that, that that requires some kind of mental effort. Right? It's not automatic. It's not just like God tells you and then you know. Right? You, you, so what are the signs? There are many different ones, but it talks about the movements of the, of the uh, planets, right? the growth of plants, right? what, uh, um, so it talks about ancient ruins, for example, as another mm -hmm. type of sign. Mm -hmm. All of these things are things that you are supposed to observe. And the idea is you need to make a mental effort to get the uh, conclusion from that, right? So for example, when you see that the, there is a regular motion of the planets, you're supposed to understand that the universe is organized. Right? And the logic mm -hmm. of the Quran is that that tells you that there's one God. If there weren't one God, then you would have sort of chaotic movements of the different planets. But it's saying that they're all moving in sync. It's like a big clockwork thing that works together. So that tells you that, that there's only one divine power, right? But, mm -hmm. but you aren't just told that. You're supposed to use your mind to get it. And it uses the word. It doesn't say the word aqil in the Quran, but it says afala right? ta'qilun. So it means aren't you going to use your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that this comes into the Shiite tradition. It's, of course, it gets taken up by the philosophers, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the, for the philosophers, everything is about al aql because sort of God is the aql. There's like a big aql out there, and he's the, he's the top level of the aql. And that's how everything in the, in the world works. Right. So um, this is, yeah, so that's, that's another piece of aql, but I, I don't know exactly which part of the, like, Nahjad Balaga they're referring to, but I, I would imagine that it's related to the discourse in the Quran that's talking about, you know, humans have an obligation to use their mind in order to derive even basic messages about religion. So... I think that's where it's coming from. Yeah, I, I agree with you that it's rooted in there. Perhaps in the Nahjul Palagha, it gets amplified and, uh, and the Imams encourage the followers to do that more obviously and more consciously. Uh, and that helps in terms of the general Shiite ethos perhaps. But I don't know if one can talk about that kind of lived experience. One question, which I don't know again, but the whole question of the Quran, I know that you yourself have done a lot of work on the Quran. So uh, either the Quran, or if you want to take uh, Qadi and Norman and the differences in terms of the law, uh, where of course the Imam becomes a central point in terms of understanding. Someone mentions here the Ismaili Quran and really, I don't know of an Ismaili Quran commentary as such. Uh, there isn't one that's preserved, perhaps Shahrastani's uh, again, and that's, you know, again, a person clouded in mystery. We think he may be smiley in latest research, but there isn't a systematic Quran commentary as far as, as we know. Uh, so general approach to that, or perhaps law, that would be our last question, if you want to make certain salient differences okay. between the Sunni and the Shia worldview. So generally, you know, in, in the work assessed at wheel and in other in other Ismaili works, there is an idea that uh, that the Quran has an inner meaning and an outer meaning, and that some of it is sort of it's allegorically organized, right? So a certain term will refer to something else, and you need to be you need to arrive at what the code is to understand. 
So a typical one is a, they say when it when it mentions light, right? It means it means knowledge, right? Or when it mentions light, it means the imam. And and so that's that's what is considered sort of the typical feature of Ismaili commentary. Sometimes it's symbolic, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's not symbolic. It's it's uh, typological, meaning that, like there's a parallelism. They will talk about Moses and and the Imam, or you know, or I mean, the typical one. If you if you look at Hadith and Manzila, right? Mm. The, the, the Prophet is supposed to have said to Ali, "You to me are like Aaron to Moses." So mm -hmm. sometimes the commentary is like that. It's it's a, you, referring to one of the biblical characters in the in the Quran and saying, "Well, that." prophet person is is parallel to the imam or one particular imam right mm -hmm. parallel to ali or parallel you know those are the comparisons of ali to jesus right mm -hmm. comparisons mm -hmm. of hussein to jesus there are comparisons of the prophet to moses there are, there are many different comparisons that are made and sometimes the the tatwil is that that you're comparing these two things and it's mm -hmm. not really a symbolic comparison it's a comparison of two characters who are similar and therefore you know act in the same way or have some some uh, uh, aspect of similarity mm -hmm. and in terms of law did the ismaili at least the the work that you translated uh does qabi and norman accept all the sources of law the quran the sunnah the ijma the qiyas so so mainly his his work is against the sunni interpretation right and he's trying to show in general that the sunni's interpretation doesn't work and so their sources you know ijtihad and qiyas are, are according to him false they don't they don't work mm -hmm. there are sources of the law but the sources are mainly there are essentially three the quran right and the the sayings of the imams right mm -hmm. and then the current imam mm -hmm. and that's that's it those are those are the sources and uh, yeah so that's his and then the rest he explains them but he explains why each one doesn't work so ijma' doesn't work right and and qiyas doesn't work and qira'i doesn't work you know all of the other ones all the other ones don't work but but the the concept of the law is on the whole there's a law and in order to be a good muslim you need to follow the law and and we know it from the quran and from these sources and if you're stuck right the last resort is well go ask the current imam he'll tell you what the story is so is there an instance that reminds me is there an instance because qadi and Oman serves four imams from north africa comes to egypt and dies very early in egypt within the first year is there any instance in his work or where if there was something that a past imam had said uh, and a present imam had a different uh, interpretation or expectation is there any time that there is the the current imam prevails over everything else everybody else all the wisdom the uh, the inter other interpretations of his so, grandparents so generally his idea is that it wouldn't contradict right okay there might be an apparent contradiction but but it won't be a real one so for okay. example he he says he had this problem and he couldn't figure out what the answer was all right mm -hmm. and so he went to the imam and because he looked in all of his hadiths and he had a lot of them he had a lot of books right and he didn't get an answer and the imam uh told him and then he told them where to find the the other hadith that he didn't know about Right. Okay. So then it was confirmed, you know, it was confirmed by what the Jafar al-Sadiq said or something. Right? It's just he didn't know about that, that report from Jafar al-Sadiq. So, so the idea is that the Imam is going to agree with his predecessors, essentially, and, and that that problem wouldn't happen. But, but the idea is that you could not know. You, know, you might even be in a position where you don't know the answer to something, and then, mm. and then you would have to seek guidance.
on that very interesting note about different imams, but not necessarily if, if there is even an apparent contradiction in, in terms of the message itself is very unified. I want to take this opportunity, uh, Devin, uh, Professor Stewart, to thank you very much. I think that, uh, you know, there is this particular series works in an incremental fashion, and I think you've added a whole, de I usually think of it as an edifice and building blocks of things, and this is a very important building block for members who are interested in furthering their own education. So we will send them for the resources. And I want to thank you for your time. We try and do it this late in the night. I don't know if in your area it's crazy rain, but in my area it's, it's crazy out here. And I was wondering if the internet would go away at some point, but we have survived all of it, it seems. So sorry, go ahead. Well, Thank you very much and thank everyone for coming um, and i uh, very glad to see you all. On that note, I want to mention to others that the next critical conversation, which will be on this Sunday, uh, it's uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 12 p.m. Central time, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, that critical conversation will be an interactive critical session conversation to explore the topic of social justice in Islam. And this time the angle that we're going to take is mental health and trauma. And our speakers for this conversation are Gulnar Firasta, Noreen Val Valani, and Salima Versi. Uh, we hope that many of you will be able to join that conversation. We've gone from racial justice to societal justice. And today, next week, we, this Sunday, we'll talk about mental health and trauma. So I hope that many of you and your family members can join. Meanwhile, uh, there is in the chat box, you should be able to get a link to the evaluations. As you sign out of uh, the Zoom, you should be able to also get an evaluation uh, there. Uh, please, we really appreciate you filling these out and also suggesting topics that you would like to read about, to like to hear about, and we can bring you additional speakers. On that note, I want to uh, thank uh, the Ismaili Tariqa and Religious Education Board for continuing to bring interesting programs for the, for the community and all the volunteer members uh, that work on it. We are both appreciative of it and have a good evening, the rest of it. Uh, stay connected. The last two questions were actually from the introduction to Qadi and Norman's Ikhtilaf that Professor Stewart has translated. I will also add that material if you want to order. And I, uh, you know, had a chance to reread it uh, before this session, and it was very interesting. Um, so let's connect and again another time. And again, thank you, Devin, for, on behalf of everyone for taking this time to be with us. Thank you for having me. All right, Khadafiz, everyone. Good night, Shabbat and inshallah, we'll see you at one of these gatherings. Assalamu.